Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Today we're talking with Dr. Timo Schaefer. He graduated with a PhD in history from Indiana University. And in 2017, he published with Cambridge University Press a book called Liberalism as Utopia, The Rise and Fall of Legal Rule in Post-Colonial Mexico, 1820 to 1900, which won the Best Book Prize from the Mexican section of the Latin American Studies Association. Dr. Schaefer, welcome. Well, hello. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for coming on. So before we get started, I wanted to ask, what first got you interested in history? Uh, what first got me interested in history? I just feel for myself that looking at present problems or present events or present predicaments historically has for me been the best way of understanding the world in which we live. So when I went to university, you know, I took courses in other disciplines, you know, in literature and sociology and political science. Um, but I've always um, found that um, looking at the origins or looking at the way that you can trace certain phenomena through backwards through time, that that is how I really understand the world best. And were, were there any specific authors who inspired this interest or any professors, for example? Um, yeah, there were. Um, I... I had the, I had the great fortune I think in my very first semester as a history student as an undergraduate history student um, to take a course with a professor at uh, Simon Fraser University in in Canada in Western Canada professor is Dr John Craig he's a, a historian of early modern Britain um, and it was a course that was just on the history of the British Isles that was it like all of the history of the British Isles you know from uh, the first recorded events or the first recorded sort of signs of human life to the present. So it was very broad. Um, but I had the fortune that he um, was not afraid to, to, uh, to expose his first year students um, with um, somewhat advanced and maybe difficult texts. And so one of the books that he assigned was The Making of the English Working Class by E.P. Thompson. And that was, um, I would say, perhaps the first time that I read a book where I thought, oh, my God, like I, I would like to, you know, I would love to be able to write books like that, that, that really helps me understand um, the history of radicalism, uh, the history of capitalism. Um, and so that is perhaps... Um, one of the first inspirations that was perhaps one of the first inspirations for me to actually to focus on history as a major. Great. Yeah. No, E.P. Thompson, uh, his, his book is, is it, it's, it, when you're, when you're talking about 20th century historiography, it seems to be one of the big moments that like a lot of people just get, got inspired by. I think that is absolutely true. And you know what, when I think back is that it's, um, I didn't know that then, but I, I realize now that it's also the first book that introduced me to the 19th century as a sort of crucible in the making of the modern world. It's, of course, a book that is about um, sort of the, 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 the age of revolution and sort of the um, effects of the revolutionary era on uh, the politics and society of uh of Britain. Um, and, and so that was really um, perhaps one of the reasons that I became a historian um, of the 19th century with a very keen interest in the age of revolutions myself. Great. And, and uh, that actually nicely segues onto my next question, which is, um, while you study, while you study uh, 19th century Mexico, you do have kind of a particular approach that's not exactly purely political history. How would you describe your method methodology and kind of theoretical approach to history? I'm interested, um, I actually started out as a historian of politics, of Mexican politics, and uh, as I sort of like pursued the research that, that I then turned into the book, um, that my, my approach sort of like turned more and more towards legal history, um, out of a realization, I think, that courts of law, that the legal system 
was really sort of like that sphere of the state, that sphere of state power that people were most directly in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I'm, I would now describe myself perhaps as a legal historian or a historian of legal culture. So unlike perhaps traditional legal historians, I'm less interested um, in following, you know, the evolution of particular laws, you know, uh, I don't know, when did... I don't know when did a law become when did when when did the state pass a law that made women more equal or something like that that's part of my interest but I'm more interested in legal culture and I mean by that I'm more interested in how people actually related to the law on a day-to-day -day basis what people went to court for in you know using the law what 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 role the law played in people's own affairs and then also how people, by making use of the, late, uh, of the legal system, in a sense, shaped the evolution um, of that legal system themselves. Interesting. That's a really, that's a, I think that's, that's a really important um, distinction that I, I think that actually a lot of the texts I've read, and I'm sure many listeners have read, could probably use because a lot of times X law will be passed, but the devil is in the details. How was that law implemented? Was that law ever anything other than dead letter? You know, uh, how did the specific legal culture in that country and the legal institutions and socioeconomics of it and other factors impact, you know, what actual, uh, you know, how that, uh, how the legal code was actually implemented? I think that's a really interesting field. Um, so, and I think so, if I if I can maybe um, just add something there, I think it's a particularly valuable way to study um, the legal history of Latin America in the 19th century, because the Latin American state, and you know, as a sort of like centralized institution, was very weak in the 19th century. Did not actually, especially at the beginning of the 19th century, did not have much coercive power. And so uh, the way in which laws would actually be implemented and become part of the social fabric of life had a lot to do um, with the way in which people interpreted them and, and you know, with the way in which people chose um, to accept them as part of their sort of like ethical universe, as part of their ethical imaginaries, if you like, had to do with to what extent were people actually willing to live by the law, even if perhaps the state would not always have the ability to enforce the law directly. That's a, that's a really interesting um, uh, point to make because like while, while the, the weakness of the 19th century Latin American state is on the one level kind of intuitive, at the same time, it's also an era of a lot of dictatorships in Latin America. So how, how do you balance out the simultaneous weakness of the state and the existence of so many dictators, or is, that, or is there actually a relationship there? Oh, that's, that's, that's a very good question, and I think I would have to think about it for a while. The, I would say that the weakness of the state in Latin America, certainly in Mexico, was most pronounced right after independence, right in the decades following independence. So, uh, you know, most Latin American nations became independent sometime in the 1820s and it was let's say between the 1820s and the 1850s or something like that that sort of centralized state institutions were weakened um, in mexico though that was actually an era when you did not have many dictatorships um, there was a very brief um, period in the early 1850s when you had a, had a dictatorship, but when you mostly had some forms of democracy or limited democracy, that is democracy where the right to vote was limited um, to people with a certain income. Um, and it was only at the end of the century when the central state became strong, became stronger at least, that it sort of... Um, uh, that, that Mexico turned into a dictatorship. So in, in a sense, the, the rise of a centralized state in Mexico corresponded to or uh, coincided with uh, the rise of a political dictatorship. And that's, that's actually a really nice segue into, my, into the next thing we were going to talk about, which is um, what the colonial legal system uh, looked like uh, before uh, Mexico becomes independent, I believe, in 1821. 
Um, yeah, so, uh, but, but, but before that, it was the Viceroyalty of New Spain, and to my understanding, it actually had a pretty effective degree of, of centralization under the Spanish state, at least, you know, the core areas, maybe not in the far north in what is today Texas and New Mexico and all the rest. But, like, what did the colonial legal system and colonial legal culture uh, look like? Yeah, um, so the, it, that's a very important question because, of course, if you um, if you want to see what changed in the Mexican legal system after Mexico became independent, you should you sort of have to start by looking at what the system was like before. So in the late colonial period, um, I would say that Mexico's legal system had three main features, and the first of those features was legal pluralism legal pluralism, by which I mean that there was not one overarching legal system that covered everybody the same and, you know, that applied the same rules to everybody, but rather that the, uh, the Mexican territory was sort of like broken up into all kinds of different jurisdictions. So, you know, one town um, might have different um, legal institutions than another town. Um, indigenous towns had different legal institutions than Spanish towns. Um, if you belong to a certain social group, if, or if you belong to, uh, let's say, a guild um, or any other organization, perhaps a militia company, then probably that organization or that company would have its own legal tribunal um, that would judge people belonging to that organization according to its own rules. So that is the first feature of the uh, of the legal system of New Spain that it is legally pluralistic. Well, I was, I was just going to ask: uh, is is that kind of pluralism like typical, only specific to colonial Mexico, or is that kind of like a broader thing within the the, the greater Spanish Empire? It's a it's a broader feature of the Spanish uh, of the greater Spanish Empire, and in fact, it's a broader um, characteristic uh, of the sort of European-centered world at the time, European empires, um, and of course, the Spanish Empire is, is the mightiest at the time, but European empires, um, or at least the, the, the largest, the one, you know, with the most amount of territory, but European empires at the time basically incorporated territories by often and or incorporated different groups and cultures by allowing them to keep at least certain features um, of their, let's say, traditional or customary legal system. Interesting. That's that's that I I, I wasn't. Uh, I mean, I'd seen like bits of it, but I didn't know it was that big of a widespread uh, phenomenon. Interesting. So you were going to say you're the second characteristic of the colonial system. So the second characteristic is it's sort of. Um, you could say maybe it's a feature of the first, but the second characteristic is legal difference between people based on what group you belong to. So based on what group to, you belong to, you not only, um, you know, live in these sort of like semi-separate jurisdictions or spheres, but you also have different rights um, and you also have different duties. You have a different legal personality, you could say. And these legal differences are organized into a hierarchy. So some people have not only different rights, but also more rights than others, or at least rights that, uh, you know, that, that you would say probably are more desirable. So indigenous people, you know, um, have, have, have certain rights, including a right to their, uh, to their land, to their townlands. But they also have the duty to provide labor um, and, and, and tribute to the state and sometimes to provide labor to individual Spaniards. Individual Spaniards, on the other hand, might have a right to indigenous labor. So there is, um, there, there, there's a, a, it, it's a system that is defined in a way um, by, by the hierarchy, by a legal hierarchy in which different people have different rights and different duties depending on what group, uh, including what racial group, they were born into. Interesting. And so these are the, the, the two main characteristics you wanted to emphasize for the colonial period. Yeah, these, these are two main characteristics. I wanted to actually um, emphasize one more, and that is um, it's a paternalistic legal system. It is a system that is based on the assumption 
And this is sort of what holds all these groups together ultimately, that everybody is subject to the paternal authority of the, uh, of the king in Spain, the Spanish crown, and this authority sort of then flows down through various um, levels of royal bureaucracy in different parts of the empire. And this paternalism um, shows itself when people go to court in order to claim their rights. And I've looked at this um, in indigenous towns in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca. I have looked at the kind of legal rhetoric or the kind of legal reasoning that, uh, that litigants used, indigenous litigants, when they sued each other before Spanish officials. And I can just give you a flavor of the kind of language they would use in order to sort of try to win their case. So one um, legal, uh, one plaintiff, one litigant, um, he came to, the to a district court in Oaxaca and he presented himself like this. I, Antonio Lopez, appear before your highness with my wife Margarita de la Cruz and my six little children pleading ardently. I have no support other than that of God and your highness who is my father and master. I am presenting the statement before your highness that I am a miserable wretch with my wife and all of my children. This is sort of the, the kind of language that you find in these legal documents. And uh, this particular man, Antonio Lopez, he used that language basically to, to try to make a case that a particular piece of land belonged to him and not his neighbor, who, who he claimed had unjustly taken it from him. But he made that case not really by talking about exactly the uh, the legal situation, the you know the the history of ownership or anything like that. He tried to win his case mostly by presenting himself as a miserable wretch appealing to the paternal protection of the court. So that is his sort of paternalism, and um, that is the third uh, main feature, I would say, of the colonial legal system in Mexico. The, that last point is is particularly interesting because I've seen something vaguely similar in the case of Cuba where it's been they've they've tried to kind of like uh, like for example in terms of the royal slaves the slaves of the crown in Santiago de Cuba they would appeal to the protection of the king uh, it, over as as an authority a paternal authority superior to local authorities who may be abusing them so they would kind of throw themselves on the mercy of, of the king and 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 his his paternal protection. So that's that's an interesting thing. I um so so now that we've got a good uh, grounding in what the colonial system more or less was like, um uh what uh, oh actually before we we get into the the independence, uh what are kind of like the main institutions of the colonial era? that we're going to be talking about? Oh, the, in, in the colonial era, well, you have um, town governments. Um, so town governments, um, cabildos or ayuntamientos, um, they're, they're called in Spanish. Um, they are usually staffed um, by local elites. You might call them patricians, so sort of like powerful, um, powerful uh, local clans who sort of um, either buy their position, it was actually often possible to buy your political position on a town council because the Spanish crown was always in need of money. Um, uh, and uh, so, so these town councils also served as courts. They had judicial functions. The, the, the councilmen or the aldermen and were also magistrates who were uh, in part in charge of hearing um, legal complaints. And then there were directly appointed Spanish officials um, the, called alcaldes mayores or corregidores. Um, they were sort of district level officials um, appointed by, by the state, by the Spanish state, who also had judicial functions. Uh, and then you had a, you know, a, a sort of higher level of courts that, that sat in Mexico City. So you had the, uh, the audiencia, which was sort of like a half administrative half judicial body that you know directly again appointed from Spain and you also had a court that existed only to offer protection to indigenous people who were abused by Spanish settlers the general Indian court uh, which also sat in Mexico City 
In- interesting. And so now that we've got a good footing in in um, uh, on on like a, a a good basis for understanding the colonial era system, what were the kind of changes that this system underwent after independence? Let me let me say first of all, let me say that um, the changes that the system underwent under independence were in a way very dramatic, but they already had precedence. They were already, if you like, prefigured in the late colonial period, in the second half, especially of the 18th century. So this old system that I described with its three main features of legal pluralism, legal difference and paternalism had already come under attack both from enlightened and uh, reformers, but also from litigants, including litigants um, from the lower classes who had started using a different language, a a, a legal language when they went to court that was based more on sort of enlightened ideals of um, personal rights, of individual rights, of reason. Um, But it was only after independence that this enlightenment attack on the colonial legal system um, could really find uh, expression, uh, not in a few piecemeal piecemeal reforms, but in a new legal order that was consistent with that critique. So after independence, what really changed um, was that at, at the sort of like most general level, sovereignty resided no longer in a monarch sitting at the apex of a sort of complex social and political hierarchy, but 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 sovereignty was now sort of thought to come from the people. It resided in the people, in the body of citizens of the nation. So this is, again, this is a change that is sort of broadly associated with the age of revolution, not just in Mexico, not just in Latin America, but in the Atlantic world. You know, this idea that people form a nation and these nations um, are sovereign. It is ultimately the citizens who um, who give the law, who give the state its authority. Uh, and this was an idea that had a very strong influence in Mexico on the new legal system that was being built in Mexico after independence. And this was a a change that led, or this was a sort of idea that led to sort of three very particular um, and very dramatic reforms or changes in the legal system. Um, The first thing that happened was that the legal system after independence became much more accessible to most Mexicans. And it became much more accessible um, because after independence, the number of municipalities grew um, by a very large margin. So before independence in the colonial period, I said that you know one of the places where you would find courts that people could appeal to, that people could go to, um, was basically in towns that had their own town council. But those towns were very few and in, very far and in between in the colonial period. There weren't that many towns. And if you didn't live directly in one of these towns, you would likely find it hard to find a court that you could take your legal business to. And after Mexican independence, something happens that scholars sometimes refer to as the municipalization of Mexican politics, by which they mean that there was a sort of proliferation of town councils. So populations or, you know, settlements that did not have formal governing structures in the colonial period now got them after independence. And these town councils continued to functions to function as courts. So aldermen sitting on these town councils um, would still also function as first instance judges. And this made the legal system all uh, overall much more accessible than it had been in the colonial period. That is the first change. A second change has to do with the transparency of the legal system, um, and it has to do with um, it has to do with the rights that litigants had um, as litigants, as citizens who came before courts in the colonial period. Um, you didn't you did not really have the right to a certain judicial process when you came to court. You really, um, you know, as I as I read to you, you sort of like threw yourself often at the mercy of the judge and then hoped that he would decide in your favor. Um, but after independence, um, courts sort of started operating by the principle of due process, 
So legal cases had to be um, had to be uh, carried out or had to had had to sort of like follow a number of steps that were meant to assure um, that everybody was treated equally by the courts. Um, and so if you if you go back to um, to court cases in the in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca that I looked at, what you now see is no longer a language appealing to the paternalism of judges, but what you now see among plaintiffs is a language that actually insists on the plaintiff's procedural rights. So plaintiffs went to the district, went to district courts whenever a justice had, in their view, misfired in their local towns or villages. And they would then describe and they would sort of um, try to get a favorable decision for themselves by describing how on the local level um, their due process rights had been violated. Um, so that was a second very dramatic change um, in the legal culture of Mexico. And then a third change, lastly, had to do um, not so much with the courts or tribunals that people could go to, but with the police forces in their towns. Um, after independence, Mexican towns created um, civic militia companies, civic militias, that basically functions, functioned as citizen police forces. And this meant that all adult males were supposed to serve in these civic militias. Um, so a town civic militia force might be, you know, 150 or 200 people strong. But of these 150 or 200 um, civic uh, militiamen, uh, only five or six had to serve on any given day. And these would serve basically as a police patrol. So they would patrol the streets. They had their little civic militia headquarters that they either rented or owned, um, where people could go to if they felt that they needed police protection. And what that means is that after independence, ordinary citizens basically entered into what you might call a constitutive relationship to the law because they themselves embodied the law and protected the law through their own service in these militias. Interesting. So um, I do have a question here, which is one of the, the recurring themes, I'm not so sure about Mexico, but in other parts of in, in, in Central America is that uh, basically the, 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 the kind of um, counterweight that basically that, that in the colonial era, uh, different indigenous groups which had communal land holdings and the like um, could rely on Spanish authorities to add, act as a counterweight to protect them against the rapacious uh, desire for land of local elites. And after independence, that the, since the Spanish uh, authorities were gone, uh, local elites kind of went to town and started destroying the the ejidos, which are the communal lands. I mean, this you, this takes decades. This isn't something that happened, you know, one day to the next. But uh, but like in terms of access to real due process, is do we start to see do we do we mar see a marked preference for those who can maybe afford a better attorney or other kinds of things to slowly ease towards the the a similar phenomenon of elites using the legal system to kind of co-opt land and, and privileges? That is something that we see. That is um, the legal system sort of like being, I don't know, being distorted or being used in favor of elites and in order to... Uh, let's say repress or let's say um, exploit or rob of the rob the lower classes of their land is something that in Mexico and I think in most of Latin America actually we see mostly happening in the second half of the 19th century yeah so I would say that the fur in Mexico the first decades of independence is when you really have the emergence the flourishing um, of quite strong quite efficient quite successful um, legal institutions that pulled people into a new, into a republican legal culture. Um, and this new republican legal culture that treated people as equal would then come under attack. Um, it would always, it would, from the very beginning, it would face some opposition, but it would especially become under attack with the rise of sort of agrarian capitalism tied to international commodity markets in the second half of the 19th century. <laughs> 
Okay, so so it's 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 a later phenomenon. Is your is your main point? The these these di this project to create this kind of more liberal uh, code of law, which is which kind of undid kind of the um, the more pluralistic and paternalistic aspects of the colonial system. Uh, how successful was it in this earlier period? Hmm. That, that in a way that is a very difficult question to answer sort of comprehensively because historians have not yet done very much research um, on the legal history or the history of legal institutions, legal culture um, in early Republican Mexico or early Republican Latin America more broadly. Um, so I have to sort of rely on my own research and I did my research in a number, in, 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 you know, in number of different regions of Mexico um, in three different regions in the states of Guanajuato, San Luis Potosí, both in the center north of the country and then Oaxaca in, in southern Mexico. Um, but I, you know, I, it's always a bit tricky or a bit dangerous to try to generalize from, you know, from one particular region or even three particular regions to what was a quite diverse country as a whole. From what I have seen in the states that I have studied is that I is that it was quite efficient. It wasn't perfect. There were, you know, um, there were sort of like legal vacuums, there were spaces where the law did not reach. Um, and I, I, I do actually want to talk in a bit about the opposition that this new legal system faced, but certainly um, compared to what historians used to assume about the legal system of Mexico um, after independence, which is that, you know, it, it was very inefficient, um, that really Mexico was characterized by sort of social anarchy after independence. Um, so compared to that sort of like picture, I would say um, that it was quite efficient, that it was definitely quite egalitarian, possibly more egalitarian, possibly um, possibly more liberal in the sense of egalitarianism, of treating everybody the same before the law um, than really any or at least than most other countries were at the same period at the same time. Interesting. And what, what makes you, you, you say that it was more efficient than most countries at the same time? You're talking, you're talking about within Latin America or just more broadly in, in the world? Well, more broadly in the, in, in the world, but also within Latin America. I think Latin America in a way stands out from the world at the time. Um, and again, one would have to make some distinctions and one would have to introduce nuances. But, but Latin America was, you know, really the first region um, where republicanism, this idea that um, the nation was composed of equal citizens, really took hold as a governing ideology that did become reflected in political institutions. So in, in, in Europe, at the same time, in Europe after the age of revolution, after, or after the Napoleonic Wars, you had a kind of, you know, um, aristocratic monarchical reaction to the ideas that had been introduced by the French Revolution into European politics. So you had a resurgence of monarchy um, you had a resurgence of social hierarchy, let's in, you know, in places like France or like Spain. Um, and in the United States, of course, um, you had um, a very strong sort of liberal Republican tradition, but in a context where these liberal or Republican ideas um, only applied to, to, to a certain part of the population, you know, you, where you still had slavery until the second half of the 19th century and where um, there was much debate about um, the benefits of slavery. Should it be abolished? You know, was it was it necessary for the nation to have slaves? And in Latin America, excluding Brazil for now, but in most of Latin America, and certainly excluding the the you know Cuba and the parts of Latin America uh, that did not gain their independence in uh, in the 1820s. But in continental Spanish America, let me say, um, you had a more widespread assumption um, that, the new, that the new nations should be based on the equality of citizens. Um, in Mexico, slavery was abolished in 1829. So that was even before slavery was abolished in the British Empire, Mexico abolished slavery. Um, 
And so I think that Latin America as a whole, at least in the realm of ideas of sort of hegemonic ideology, um, was ahead um, of other parts of the world um, in sort of like being based or, or, or adhering to these Republican ideas. And then within Latin America, Mexico stands out, um, I think, for for the level, the extent of the involvement of what you might loosely term the popular classes. So, you know, laborers, uh, peasants, indigenous people in the independence war, in the war um, that freed Mexico from Spanish, from Spanish rule. So the independence war in Mexico was not just a kind of political revolution, it was also a social revolution. And that sort of social revolution was then reflected in the new institutions and in the Republican institutions that were created in Mexico after independence. And so I think in Mexico, even compared to other Latin American countries, you had a stronger Republican tradition, a, a stronger um, a stronger Republican mentality in society. Yeah, because Mexico does have this kind of uh, like a distinct characteristic, which is that Oh, it's one of a few countries where independence was actually originally given by, I mean, lowercase c conservatives in the case of Mexico, who tried to create a new monarchy, the, the, the first Mexican empire under Agustin de Iturbide, right? And so you had the, 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 the Mexican uh, peasants, uh, who tr and many of them indigenous, who struggled uh, in the beginning of the uh, independence movement, or at least... Uh, who, who fought under Hidalgo, uh, failed. Then in the 1820s, you got this conservative version of independence, but the conservative independence was overthrown. And then you got this kind of much a, a more Republican radical version, which succeeded it. So it is, it's kind of a, 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 like a dance and battle between these different forces. It is. I, I, I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't overplay the, the conservatism of Mexican independence. Mexican independence was achieved not only by Iturbide, who was certainly, who I would describe as a conservative and who did try to, to make himself an emperor, Emperor Agustin the, uh, the First, I think, is, is what he titled yeah. himself. But actually, in order, to, achieve, uh, in, in, in order to, to, to get to power, he had to negotiate and he had to come to an agreement with the insurgents, with some of the same people who had earlier fought under Hidalgo, um, especially the people who in, in Western Mexico, Western, Southwestern Mexico, had fought under Vicente Guerrero. And so independence really was a kind of compromise between the conservative Iturbide and the radical Guerrero. Um, and it was, um, of course, Itrobide then sort of like tried to rid himself eventually of the more radical faction. He was very unsuccessful uh, in that he was um, overthrown when he tried to make himself an emperor after maybe a year. It's either a little less or a little Two more years. than a year. A little more than a year then. And he yeah. then he, he went into exile to, to Europe and then he tried to stage a comeback and was caught um, upon landing on the Mexican coast and was unceremoniously shot by a firing squad. So that was the end, really, um, of um, native monarchism in Mexico, at least for, for a generation. Um, and so, so these, this kind of the more radical faction, at least within the context of, you know, the, the Mexico of the time kind of won out and was able to implement a vision that's kind of much, a bit more... Um, egalitarian than in maybe even other parts of Latin America at the time, is what you're saying. Yeah, I would say so. Now, one of the things that is that is important to my story, though, is that this more egalitarian and radical vision did from the very beginning face opposition. And in the, you know, when, when I say that in the second half of the century, um, a new illiberal legal system came to came to replace or or sort of came to overlay the the original um, egalitarian republican legal system. Um, then I would say that the the forces behind this new illiberalism that would sort of culminate in the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz at the end of the century. Porfirio Diaz was dictator of of, of Mexico roughly between 1876 and 1911. I say roughly because there was a short period at the beginning of his reign where he ceded power to somebody else for a few years. 
but mostly um, the period between 1876 and 1911 in, uh, is sort of described usually by Mexican historians as a dictatorship by Porfirio Diaz, also called the Porfiriato, based on his first name. And so um, the social forces that would sort of um, culminate and, and stand behind and bring to power Porfirio Diaz, they were already present in the early Republican period opposing the new um, egalitarian legal system. And what is it that um, that caused them to kind of win out in the end? Is there, because I, cause I remember in the... Um, a, uh, Benito Juarez and and others in the middle of the of the nineteenth century were were actually trying to push. I mean, I'm not sure if a left right dynamic is appropriate to use in this context. It may be a bit anachronistic, but it was kind of m a bit more of a left project within the Republican tradition, right? So why is it that Juarez is is, is moving forward, but then we we end up seeing the 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 more right wing versions win out. I think ultimately um, the success of the Republican project, of the egalitarian legal project, depended on two things above all. Um, it depended on the spread of local legal institutions, the proliferation of local legal institutions through the creation of new municipalities that would make local courts of law widely accessible to people that would also create their own civic militias and their own citizen police forces, as I described earlier. And it also depended on the idea um, that there was just one uniform set of legal rules that applied equally to all Mexicans. And both of these ideas um, were opposed from the very beginning of the Republican period in Mexico, um, the idea that there should be just one, uni uh, one uniform set of legal rules was opposed above all by the army, by the Mexican military. The Mexican army was one of the two institutions, the other was the church, but the church in this regard I think was less, was less important. Uh, but the, the army, one of the institutions that was able to insist and sort of to, to, to have constitutionally protected its own legal difference. So the army had its own jurisdiction. And when soldiers came into conflict with civilians, as they often did, the sort of abuses that soldiers um, committed against civilians became notorious in Mexico in the early Republican period. Um, civilian authorities did not have the right to bring the, to, to, to judge those soldiers to bring them to trial and to punish them as they would, you know, uh, try anybody else for similar offenses. The soldiers would rather be judged by military courts. And so the army was one of the forces um, that opposed the creation of a strictly egalitarian legal order because it insisted on a kind of privilege or at least on a kind of separation of its members. Right. Wait, quick, quick question. Was this related to the kind of fueros principle? I think that's the term for it. The the, the fuero, which is like the special right to, to different uh, legal treatment under this uh, under Spanish rule, right? Right. Yeah, that's correct. It was the fuero militar, right? It was what it the military fuero, which is a special jurisdiction, basically, is how you would say it in English. I think so. Uh, really, a special court system that apply uh, that 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 was in charge. Um, of of dealing with army criminal offenses, um, and that was not accountable um, to civilian leaders. Yeah. Um, and, and so the army became immensely more influential in Mexican public life in the eight in the in the in the decades roughly between the eighteen forties and the eighteen sixties. And so because the army, and it became more influential because the 1840s to the 1860s are a period of increasing warfare, including civil warfare. So in the 1840s, you have the beginning of a number of sort of local revolts breaking out, um, sort of social revolts breaking out in different parts of the country, and the army is sent to suppress them. In the 1840s, of course, you also have the international warfare between Mexico and the United States. 
um, which Mexico loses, but which still give the army sort of like a greater weight um, in, in, in the political life of the nation. And then in the 1850s and the 1860s, you have um, both civil and international warfare between civil warfare between liberals and conservatives. Um, and these are sort of like um, the, the most uh, significant, the bloodiest civil wars that Mexico up to that point experiences in its post-independence um, history. So there had been er there, there had been earlier sort of like small um, military revolts, but they had not in, uh, involved many people. But the civil war between the liberals and the conservatives in the 1850s and 1860s um, really engulfed the whole country in warfare. And this, uh, the civil war also then acquired in the 1860s an international dimension between, because after the conservatives lost the first round of warfare, they basically went to the French and, and got themselves French support and the French tried to install a, a monarchy, the empire, uh, the empire of Maximilian in, in Mexico. And so that would then sort of like reignite the war between the liberals and the conservatives, where the conservatives now also can count on the support um, of, of French soldiers who, who are fighting in Mexico and um, giving an, interna an international dimension to this warfare. And eventually the liberals win, right? Mexico wins against France. The French are um, kicked out of the country. If you like, the conservatives finally lose the war of uh, the, the war of the French intervention in 1867. Emperor Maximilian uh, and his two um, most important generals are shot um, or die before a firing squad, just as uh, Agustin Iturbide, who had earlier tried to crown himself emperor, also had died before a firing squad. Uh, that, that is the fate, apparently, of would-be emperors in, in 19th century Mexico. But the result, the sort of like long-term consequences of this conflict is that it militarizes Mexican society um, and gives the army, which had been the institution most opposed to a sort of Republican, to an egalitarian legal order, but it gives that army more power. Politicians are now often generals. They are people who had fought in the civil wars. Those are the people who come to dominate local politics. And so this is one of the ways um, in, which, in, in, in which a sort of like oppositional force, a force that had always sort of like opposed the new egalitarian legal order um, in post-independence Mexico, in which it gains in power because of this increased role, in this, this increased importance of the army in political affairs after the civil wars. This is a really interesting point. I actually have a question specifically about the army's composition. From my understanding, uh, I mean, not just in Mexico, in most of the world at the time, officers often bought their their position uh the officer corps would buy what would become would be the sons of rich uh families and upper middle class families who would buy a captain uh the position of captain or lieutenant or whatever for their child so you would so the the, the wealthier families were disproportionately represented in the upper hierarchy of the military and of course the wealthier families who were used to their 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 own privileges given by money would kind of it would make sense that they would in addition to the fact that the military the the officers in the military for, because they were part of the military would be opposed to a more egalitarian system it would 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 the kind of class dynamics also play into it yeah certainly they would so in Mexico you weren't able to buy a position you weren't able to buy let's say you know a, a, I don't know, a generalcy or something like that. Um, yeah. Though I'm officially speaking, formally, you weren't, you know, it, it, it wasn't something that was legal. You weren't able to buy it legally. Um, how much corruption played a role actually in people getting these positions is another question. But certainly even, you know, to, to very regularly to become a general in the Mexican army or an officer, um, you had to have a certain educational level. Um, you probably had to be educated in a military college, in the military college in, in, in Mexico City. And so this was not something that was available 
to most Mexicans. So there's definitely that class dynamic that is present. Interesting. And one other one other aspect, uh, you mentioned that you didn't think that the, I, I think you kind of downplayed the, the church's opposition a bit, or you're just saying that the, the church's opposition was less significant than that of the army. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. The, the church in the early Republican decades, um, the church also had its special fuero, uh, the, the, its special fuero, its special church jurisdiction, but that was less important because there were fewer churchmen, there were fewer members of the clergy um, living, uh, you know, in, in most places, in most towns or villages or cities and coming in, in, in daily contact with Mexican citizens. It was the soldiers, you know, who would actually um, be, become notorious for sort of like being rowdy and drinking and then maybe starting brawls or fights with Mexican civilians or maybe, you know, just robbing Mexican civilians or beating them up, whatever, right? Um, and the church was not, the church, churchmen, the, the clergy did, do not seem to have engaged in that sort of behavior. Now, the church was very influential, though, also in putting its weight in the civil wars of the, 18, uh, of the 1850s and 1860s behind the conservative vision. The church, however, um, picked the losing side, right? The church was defeated. And so the church as an institution, I think, had less to do um, than the army. Had the, the church has less to do with sort of um, consolidating or um, creating these new institutions um, that were in a way anti-liberal and anti-egalitarian. No, it's just, it was interesting to me because when I've, in other texts I've read, they always emphasize the role of the church because I think, if I'm recalling correctly, the church in Mexico, Catholic church in Mexico had, they, I mean, the Catholic church had lands in all the countries where it predominated, it, like it was a la major landowner, but I think in, in Mexico, it was, I think, the largest proportion in all of Latin America in terms of land ownership. I mean, like for, for the Catholic church. That's right. That's right. And so, and, and one of the reasons the civil wars broke out in the 1850s was that the liberal government um, of Benito Juarez tried to um, strip the church of its landholding, right? To, to disentail the corporate landholdings of the church. Um, and, and so the church, you know, was a major force then in rising up or in, in sponsoring and inciting an uprising um, against the liberal government. But it lost out, so that so so I think we can't really blame the church in the end for um, establishing a dictatorship, an illiberal dictatorship in the country at the end of the century. Right. There was, right. however, um, a different force of landowners or of property owners who are the second major force, I would say, this the second major social force behind. Um, behind the fall or the, 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 the slow crumbling or defeat of an egalitarian legal order in Mexico in the 19th century. And those are um, big landowners or hacendados, that is owners of haciendas, of agricultural estates. And owners of agricultural estates um, from the very beginning were opposed to the new egalitarian system, um, the, the new egalitarian legal system, um, and they directly came in conflict with the sort of egalitarian pretensions of the Mexican Republic when people who lived on these estates, the tenants of the hacendados, and you know, peasants who basically rented land from them, when these peasants tried to create their own town governments on these privately owned estates. This is something that started happening in the 1820s. It was part of this phenomenon of municipalization of creating new municipalities that would also function as court of laws, uh, as courts of law, and that would make the law accessible to most Mexicans. Um, so tenants, not all, not tenants on all haciendas, but tenants on a minority of haciendas sort of agitated for the creation of, uh, of municipalities on the estate. And they made the argument that they needed these municipalities, there needed to be municipalities because if there weren't municipalities, then they would continue to live under the tyranny 
of the landowner and the tenants associated this tyranny with the old regime, with the colonial era. They said under a Republican system of rule, it wasn't possible um, that they would still um, not only rent their land, but you know, not only be in the sort of subordinate economic relation with the landowner, but also be in the subordinate social and even political and legal relation with this landowner who was able in a way to control their lives because their settlements were located on his land. And so landowners were the second major force um, very strongly, who, who very strongly were in opposition to the new um, legal system in Mexico who opposed it directly. And landowners also gained in strength, gained in power in the middle decades of the 19th century. They gained in power um, because the Mexican economy started to grow again, probably starting in the 1840s, and especially became tied to international markets for agricultural commodities. And this meant that landowners, you know, profited from this new international economic order and, uh, you know, started having more resources, more money, um, and they were able to translate that into more political power. And they, landowners, certainly then put their power behind the illiberal legal system, the illiberal dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. This is, this is an interesting point. In terms of one of the things that I've... Um that I've that's kind of seems to be a general phenomenon after independence is that a lot of the uh, the agro export kind of el uh, elites uh, the 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 cacao producing planters of, of Venezuela you know they are kind of ruined by the independence wars which end up destroying a lot of their mines their lands you know and so they their relative power is weakened but now what you're saying is that uh, that you know as they they kind of recover and kind of gain momentum back they become a more a much stronger political force mid-century and start putting their finger on the scale so to speak in favor of you know they uh, kind of slowing slowing down and distorting this more egalitarian version of of uh of the legal system yeah, that's right. One way to think about it is, one way that I think about it is that both the army and the landowners were able to create um, a legal exception for its members in the case of the army, and even sort of like a legal exception in a spatial or a geographical sense in the case case of the landowners. Yeah, They were able to, pre to create or to insist on the existence of spaces, namely their land holdings, where the new egalitarian legal order couldn't penetrate, where it was sort of suspended. Um, and so what actually I think then characterized the legal order in Mexico at the end of the century under the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz was not a wholesale destruction of the egalitarianism of the, of the early Republican period, because the local courts of law, the municipal courts of law, kept functioning, and as far as I can tell, kept functioning in most places in a more or less, um, you know, egalitarian, liberal, transparent manner. But what happened is that this egalitarian legal system became sort of honeycombed by, this, by these exceptional legal spaces or by certain contexts, by, by, you know, in, in, in which the law could be suspended by the rich and powerful. And so that kind of is what what what, um, what characterizes the Mexican legal system go, going running up to uh, the Porfiriato towards the end of the century, right? Yeah, that's the that's the kind of legal system that the Porfiriato then really um, expresses. Um, or, or that, the, that, the, that really becomes consolidated, I would say, during the Porfiriato, that becomes sort of, that one cannot oppose anymore. Um, so it's a legal system that is actually quite, it's, it's a legal system that is again based on the privilege of a few. And in that sense, it's again a bit like the, the, the legal system in the colonial period. But it's also a, a, a very different kind of legal privilege that people have under the Porfiriato than they had in the colonial period, because in the colonial period, legal privilege meant 
that you belonged to a group that had priv that had privilege that had certain rights, um, and those rights you know belonged to you um, due to who you were, due to your birth, due to your social status, due to your race. Under the Porfiriato, everybody was still supposed to be equal. Actually, elites under the Porfirian dictatorship sort of prided themselves on the you know legal egalitarianism of Mexico, they thought, or they pretended to think, that Mexico was still a republic in which every, where everybody was equal. But if you actually look at the institutional structure um, of the legal system under the Porfiriato, you see um, that this egalitarianism um, did not exist for people in, in positions of power, that these, that these people in positions of power had the ability to suspend the ordinary legal order in places or in situations in which it was convenient to them. And so it was a kind of hidden privilege, or at least a privilege that was not publicly acknowledged, but that was very strongly represented in the institutions of the dictatorship um, that, characterized, uh, that characterized the legal order in late 19th century Mexico. Interesting. So it's we kind of see this uh, evolution from the colonial era where money was obviously a part of it. The wealthy had certain privileges, but it was more about um, kind of like a group, uh, groups like the church or the indigenous group, uh, you know, an, an indigenous culture or a specific uh, like caste, like the military had its own had its own thing, and we saw it kind of being dismantled throughout the 19th century, and then by the end of the 19th century, we see it kind of resurface, but in a nominally nominally it doesn't resurface, but in practice we see it resurfacing, centered around the privileges of this resurgent landed elite. Yeah, it's but it's a very I I would insist that it's a very different kind of privilege, because the privilege right. under the colonial order it was based on the idea everybody had different legal personalities and different legal rights and the rights of some people were in a way you could say better than others you know it's it's better to be a person um, who can draw on the labor on the labor of his inferiors than to, than to be the inferior who has to provide labor but even the inferior groups let's say the indigenous people they did have certain rights and institutions existed in which they could claim their rights at the end of the 19th century, under the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, nominally speaking, everybody has the same right, but really the institutional structure of the country is such that in certain places, let's say on agricultural estates, you cannot claim the rights that you nominally possessed. So it's a kind of, um, it's, it's a kind of legal privilege that the elites have that, that, that is based on draining out the, the legal personalities of their inferiors. Their inferiors, they, you know, supposedly they have rights, but they have nowhere to claim them. In, uh, to quote uh, Animal Farm, everyone is equal, but some people are more equal than others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think that this has been a very interesting kind of introduction to the... Uh, to what the uh, legal culture and legal institutions of uh, 19th century Mexico have, ha, ha, were like. Um, I think that this is definitely, it's something that, it's, it's an approach that I didn't come across during my undergraduate, but I think it's a very interesting and very valuable approach. And I think our listeners can see why this is something that it def, that's definitely going to be something that I, I hope a, a several of them will, will be looking into. I certainly will be. Um, before we wrap up today, I wanted to ask, uh, two last questions, which I ask all of our guests. First, what are some of the um, important pending challenges in your field right now? I think, um, oh, what are some of the important pending challenges? I think I want, I mean, I want to see, um, first of all, I want to see more scholars in general return to the 19th century. I feel that... Uh, 
I, I, you know, if I look at the publications in, in, in Latin American history, then I see a lot that is being done right now, a lot of work being done on the 20th century and, and then some work being done on the colonial period. And the 19th century, I, I, I feel, is not getting enough attention. Um, and I think that is really a pity because I think that um, the 19th century is where you really can, is, is the period to which you can trace many of the origins um, of the particular structures um, of the political systems and the legal systems um, in Latin America, you know, that, that, that are still in place in Latin America at present. And I, 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 I think also that, that people just have to pay, uh, or an, another thing that I would like to see done, another challenge, I think, is to, um, you know, look, look more at legal institutions, look more at legal culture um, in 19th century Latin America, 19th century Mexico, um, and, and sort of like realize um, that the legal sphere was where people most consistently came in contact with new ideals, with new Republican ideals and with Republican state institutions. And I think not very much has been done in that regard um, so far. And uh, on the flip side of that question, what are some of the more kind of important achievements that you've seen in your field in the last couple of years? In the last couple of years, we. Oui. Or kind of interesting projects that you've seen develop or interesting uh, writers and, you know, scholars who have kind of been emerging. Yeah, yeah. I, would, the, I mean, I think there's a lot of really interesting, really valuable work done being done right now on the legal history of colonial Latin America, especially. Um, uh, so we, we, we're seeing a lot more work that actually um, looks at how ordinary people or popular actors interacted with the legal system and made use of the legal system um, in Latin America. So uh, Michelle McKinley, you know, has a had a book out, I think, maybe a year ago or two years ago called Fractional Freedoms. Uh, it looks at the way in which slaves in, I believe, in Lima, in Peru, mostly in Lima, interacted with legal institutions. And, it you know, it looks at the contradiction of slaves being at the same time legal property but also being given certain legal rights and therefore being certain, you know, having a legal personality, even as they were property under the legal system. And so it looks at, at the way that slaves interacted with the colonial legal system. There's a wonderful book um, that came out last year by Bianca Primo called uh, The Enlightenment on Trial. And I actually um, drew on it a little bit earlier um, in this interview to talk about the legal system, to talk about the challenges that the, that the colonial legal order already experienced in the late uh, 18th century, that is towards the end of the, of, of the colonial period. So The Enlightenment on Trial is a really wonderful book um, that looks at how the Enlightenment was partly made not just by you know, philosophers, not just by statesmen or legal scholars, but by ordinary people who insisted on their rights, who sort of like used an enlightenment language, you could say, um, in making and presenting their arguments in courtrooms all over Latin America. So that's another, I think, a, a very, very important contribution. And I think it's both of these books by Michelle McKinley and uh, Bianca Primo are sort of part of a sort of flourishing of uh, legal scholarship in, in colonial Latin America. That is very exciting. Perfect. So with that, thank, uh, thanks again for coming on. Uh, I think this has been a great episode and I look forward to uh, following your career in the future. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.